Welcome to Real Estate Radio Live, an informative and engaging podcast discussing everything you need to know about the world of real estate. Your host, Joe Kachera, provides you with insight and guidance on how to buy, sell, finance, and invest in real estate. He also offers real estate tax management strategies, new construction advice, home improvement tips, and much, much more. And now, to guide you around the world of real estate, here's your host and Real Estate Radio Live team leader, Joe Kachera. Welcome in, Joe Kachera with Real Estate Radio Live. Thank you again for those that continue to follow the show and tune in. Uh, we have a what we think is a great show for you today. We're talking about uh, what happened to Zillow. Most of you may or may not have seen it in the news, but Zillow has kind of been the bellwether of the, you know, kind of the ultimate where people go to look for their home values and what, what's happening in the marketplace, a number of other things that really became popular, a very, a very big brand name in the real estate industry. But there's been some recent changes and some interesting dynamics that have taken place. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. And for that, we bring in my good friend, Jack Russo, who is uh, going to be discussing this via Mexico. I don't want to give up, give too much information without your authorization, Jack, but do you want to give the listeners an idea of where you're uh, where we're doing yeah, I mean, Zoom from? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, occasionally I get a vacation every <laughs> once in a while. And usually it's tied to a case that was earmarked for two or three weeks of trial, which we had one that settled. And so as a result of that, that kind of opens up your calendar. And if you're smart, you just parachute out and don't schedule anything else. And basically take the time off to recharge because I don't think you can really practice law or really any profession without taking time off at least once and maybe even twice. And I know some attorneys that do it three, four times a year, particularly attorneys that practice in cold weather states like Minnesota or Montana or mm -hmm. places like New York, which are challenging in the winter. And um this time of year particularly october november december january february uh mexico is a real treat because the weather is just perfect and the fishing is great i mean and the whale watching is unbelievable so i won't reveal the location because i really don't want it to become more popular because it seems <laughs> as though if it becomes too popular it kind of ruins it but you know to me there's a whole world and a whole different culture couple hour plane ride to the south which of course most americans don't do although more and more of them i think are discovering the value because the peso is at like 20 to a dollar so the exchange rate is great of course the real estate values keep going up and i think that's kind of what it kind of ties into zillow in the sense that zillow uh, is a good a good story of essentially one business the business of information management, if that's what you want to call Zillow, becoming a, what they thought was a great complementary business, was, which was to allow people to immediately sell their house mm -hmm. to Zillow. Yeah. And the problem that came up, according to the published literature, there may have been other problems, but the problem that I read was they couldn't get enough actual hands on the ground appraisals and people to really put um some numbers together to make the purchase and selling process as seamless as they wanted to make it in other words you can build this beautiful information system but then there's actually got to be people involved in the sort of actual finalization and that last link what might be called like the last mile uh couldn't get nailed down because there weren't enough people to do the, the actual on the ground work, whatever you want to call it, whether it's appraisal or fixing up or staging or doing this or doing that. And so they've abandoned, they're getting out of that business apparently, and they're selling whatever inventory they've acquired uh, to some hedge funds in kind of a block basis. They've essentially decided they can't, they can't actually be in this complimentary business of sort of saying to people, okay, we can, we can buy your house on a, on a seamless basis, mm -hmm. which of course is where we thought maybe the industry was headed, which would more or less wipe out the traditional brokerage and the traditional 
approach to buying and selling houses because you essentially would work through uh, someone like Zillow that would inventory your house and then presumably uh, handle the eventual resale, right? Mm -hmm. or, or rental or whatever they were going right. to do with these. Right. So, so it's a good example of how you can have really smart people at a really great company come up with a, what sounded like a great idea and then when you actually put it into practice, you realize, oops, there was a, an assumption in this that didn't turn out to be true. Right. And that happens a lot with startups, even with well-funded, because that was a well-funded uh, complementary business to an existing successful business. I mean, Zillow's become an amazing success, including an amazing uh, stock market success, if you look at what happened after it went public. I haven't looked at it recently. I'm imagining that it probably took a hit as a result of kind of exiting from this other business, right? Yeah, they refer to it as um, the iBuyer. iBuyer, you hear that a lot just for those consumers who are listening to the podcast, you're not familiar. You may see that in, in the media, the news and online a lot. But yeah, in, in essence, what Jack's saying is Zillow was going in buying properties with the idea that they were going to, you know, turn around and sell them or rent them. And, you know, the problem, I think, you know, if it's on a small scale and I, and I, I explain this to people all the time, I get calls, I don't know how many times a week or a month, people concerned about Joe, Joe, should I buy in a market like this? And what they mean is a market where, you know, it's ascending and depreciation and it's been, you know, you, you got this 20, 30, 40, 50% run over the last four or five years and starts making people very nervous. But I still believe I've been doing this long enough that if you're buying a piece of property for your primary residence, you plan to live there, stay there, keep it for, you know, at least seven plus years or so. I think it's always, you got a fair chance to succeed and do well. I think where most people get in trouble is, they jump in, they, they feel like they're going to lose out. So they jump in and they pay a premium or they pay way too much. And then for some reason, they're forced to sell when they don't want to or when the market is not so good, et cetera, et cetera. So if you can imagine on a large scale Zillow buying, I don't know how many thousands of properties. Yeah, and, they bought a lot. They called, they called it Zillow Offers. I guess yeah, that was the branch. Right. I'm right. just looking at their chart. I'll send you the chart, but it looks okay. like the stock climbed from the end of last year to what looks like November, December of I mean, two years ago, the end of, well, whatever that was. And it looks like it climbed to $203 a share or so, which is triple what the value is today. The value today is about 68 bucks a share. And that still gives it a market cap of 17 billion. So it used to have a market cap of over 50 billion at a time when I think people thought this new complementary business was essentially going to allow it to own a lot of the brokerage business, effectively becoming like the algorithm would decide the value of your house. And then you'd be able to press a button and say, okay, I'm ready to sell my house. What's the value? And then the algorithm gives a value. And then you settle and you sign and you're done. And I guess people did that, but Zilla realized that I think they had to actually have more feet on the ground than they could actually hire to get right. the details of this done. At least that's the way the Wall Street Journal reported it. I mean, they had a funny line like, you know, what happened to Zilla on the way to, to trying to become the biggest brokerage firm in the world? And a lot of the stock market value was based on that. And so it's down basically two thirds from its height, right. uh, which is quite, quite, a, quite a, down, a downtrend. I mean, the company still has its main business, which I guess is just purely informational, right? Well, informational, but they also sell leads. They make most, a lot of their money selling leads to uh, real estate and mortgage people. They do a bit of that. You know, I do think the other way, the other thing that got them in trouble was, and, you know, we see this in all industries, Jack, doesn't matter what it is, is you'll see a startup starting to do something or there'll be something that all of a sudden becomes kind of trendy or, you know, exciting or new. In this case, it was 
a company like uh, most people, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Open Door. Open Door is one of the probably the most successful kind of iBuyer programs launched out there with a lot of smart, successful people that have a lot of money. And I think companies like Zillow, even to a certain extent, a lot of the traditional historic real estate companies felt like they had to tell the public that they also have an iBuyer program, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so I think this was part of the issue that they got into and they jumped into something because they felt they may lose out and maybe they better offer this. That could be part of the, the real estate, the future of real estate. And, you know, maybe it still is, but this is going to be a big shift for them. I, the analogy, and I think it's good. Again, I try to do for the podcast, just for, we just have to assume not everybody, you know, understands and realizes real estate uh, to a certain degree and level, but, for, so I'll give you an example. This whole iBuyer program, last time I looked, it was a couple of months ago, but the percentage of houses or units that were bought, paid cash for, no offer, never get on the market, just this whole iBuyer concept was about 5% of all total sales or all total transactions in the United States. So even though you hear it on a large scale and you're talking about thousands, you know, you, when you're dealing with millions of transactions, percentage wise, it's still very, very small. You still have 90 to 95% of people that are using kind of traditional broker, real estate connections and relationships. And it's probably not the same because there, there's a difference between a car and a house, certainly, but similar to what we're seeing with electric, there's this you know, obviously a lot of excitement and, and around electric vehicles. And I, I want to say the number is by 20, is it by 2050? They're saying that 50% of all vehicles will be electric. Um, that could be, that could be correct. But who's the leader in that? You know, we talk about Tesla and maybe a couple others, but we'll see what happens with that. Um, but we still got a long way to go is, is my point. And you wonder on the way to meeting this numbers, Jack, whether it's Tesla or whether it's the United States trying to get the 50% electric, or if it's the question is you and I are sitting here talking to real estate, you know, will this be a model in 20 years from now? Will this be, or maybe they're just ahead of themselves like a lot of companies and industries do, you know, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think what you're referring to in business is sometimes called the bandwagon effect. Yeah, where people all want to get on the bandwagon and they feel like they're going to get left out. So if the bandwagon happens to be electric cars, you know, finally BMW, Ford, GM. Of course, GM had the first electric car like 40 years ago and then more or less killed it. Um, There's a long story about that. But conceptually, it's not as though the electric car was invented by Tesla. It wasn't. This idea of doing, you know, this this internet based buying and selling is treating a house like it's a car or a commodity mm -hmm. that it can be priced with some degree of precision around algorithms that can say, well, here's your location, here's the comps, here are the real estate taxes, here's the views, here's the amenities, here's the number of bathrooms, bedrooms, square footage, blah, blah, blah. And then that magic calculation without a third party human appraiser, just the computer itself will spit out a number that will be more or less a fair number within a certain degree of error because it's never perfect. And, you know, that's so against the way people think of their most major asset of their lifetime is typically their home. Mm -hmm. and certainly it's the biggest thing that carries the biggest debt in terms of home financing. And so for a lot of people, it's a very emotional sell. And some people like to make sure they're selling their home to a buyer that they think is going to really take care of it or value it to the same degree. Like it becomes almost like an emotional sale, almost like it's part of your family. And you see that still. But there is certainly a role in my mind for algorithmic style uh, selling and buying of like track homes that are more or less identical to each other. You know, they're not really that different. They're, they're almost like punched out homes. Yeah. And as we see more of these homes become like 
you know, um, homes that are manufactured homes where literally it is a punched out home and there really isn't any difference between one and another. I think we are going to see this digital buying and selling uh, start to take hold. But I think you're right that in general, we're still uh, a little reluctant. Most of the selling public and most of the buying public want an expert or two to help them. And that's typically a licensed real estate broker and a licensed loan broker like yourself and other licensed people, sometimes a licensed appraiser. These are all licensed professions designed to help people just like a licensed attorney Mm -hmm. designed to act in a fiduciary capacity to make sure that someone is not making a mistake or at least has their eyes open to whatever issues are out there. So there isn't a lot of regret. Mm -hmm. Uh, Indeed, in, in, in New York, you can't do a real estate purchase or sale without a lawyer signing off on the paperwork. In California, it's more like standardized forms and lawyers don't necessarily have to be involved, although at times when the deal is big enough, uh, both parties will get lawyers involved as well. So it's an interesting march towards uh, streamlining more and more of it. Of course, you've been a big proponent of trying to get more streamlining uh, into the deal right. in the way in which uh, you know complementary things get done to avoid all the transaction costs. Because the reason people have to hold for seven, eight, 10 years is the transaction costs eat up a lot of the gain. Yeah. You can't, it's not too easy to, to flip a house unless you have a crazy market, as maybe we do, where 30, 40% gains are happening year over year and people can flip a house over a couple of year period and still do well, even with all the transaction costs. Right, right. right? <clears throat> yeah. No, I think that's well said. We'll see what... Uh, you know, we'll see how this pans out. It'll be interesting also to, you did say that part of the article talks about they're going to be selling the majority of them or all of them to a hedge fund or. I think they lined up a hedge fund, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that, like, I mean, hedge funds exist for this sort of movement of money. So if there's a batch of, let's call it 10,000 houses and let's say they're priced at a million dollars a piece. I mean, a hedge fund can cut that check for whatever that number is, $10 billion, and can say, yeah, we can basically take these houses and get a discount in the batch purchase. And there were some numbers as to how, what on average Zillow was buying, and it wasn't a million dollars. I think the average number was more like six or 700,000, at least in California. So these are not, you know, high end houses. Yeah, no, that's true. Middle class houses, right? (laughs) So they're easy to buy. They're easy to sell. They're probably relatively easy to fix up. And so some hedge fund is going to come in and presumably make a gain where Zillow will probably take a write-off is my guess of what's yeah. happening. They're sort of making a corporate decision to exit a initiative that some of the articles said it was just a toy or a trial balloon to see what would happen. Mm-hmm. I always wonder whether they would alienate their major customers, which are mostly real estate brokers. Yeah, well, it, say, it, well is, uh, it is a funny relationship. I mean, there's a there's a segment of real estate, the real estate ind- industry that really, you know, despises and dislikes Zillow. And then it's kind of a, unfortunately, well, it's a double-edged sword for them because there's a lot of real estate agents that that, you know, say, hey, I get a lot of my great leads. And even though I got to pay them a referral fee or I got to pay them, typically they pay them um, instead of referral fees where Zillow makes most of their money has traditionally been advertising. So they'll, for instance, if you're a real estate agent and you like, you know, you want to be in two or three major zip codes to be known as the real estate agent in that zip code, uh, because Zillow has the eyeballs and they could sell uh, they could sell that space to a real estate agent and say, OK, every time someone pulls up a home and, you know, nine, five, one, two, five or nine, five, six, two, three or whatever it is, your your name and your face are going to come up right alongside. Um, so that's historically how they make most of their money. And, you know, the people paying the freight 
are real estate agents and loan officers for the most right. part. But now, but now think of this for a second, because I think this may have been why Zillow decided to at least set this trial balloon up and see where it would go. If you're Zillow, you have to be thinking to yourself, there's going to be some competition sooner or later. The biggest competitor, of course, would be Google. Google could easily decide to get into this space and with algorithms say, we'll give you some pricing data. We love chewing on big data. That's what Google does. Google basically consumes big data. I mean, Google delivers uh, case law without charge, which was a big business and still is for West and Lexus, the big, you know, uh, duopoly in the legal field, but uh, you could get free case law and free statutes from from uh, Google without any charge at all. Wow. So if you're Zillow, you got to be thinking to yourself, what's the next big chomp of data that Google may want to sort of consume? They're consuming it, you know, sort of inch by inch. And so if you start thinking that way, you start saying to yourself, particularly when there's a bandwagon like the one you just described, hey, maybe we need to kind of have this complimentary business where we're buying and selling houses because we can't imagine that Google will ever do that. Mm -hmm. And we've got to differentiate ourselves from Google or from whoever else might decide to get into this business where it's just chomping at big data, right, yeah. in a huge way. And, you know, so far, it doesn't look like Google has gone in that direction. And so far, the monopoly, if that's what Zillow has. I mean, I guess there are a few other players that sort of are in the same game. But Zillow's acquired a few of them, too, right? Then they acquired Trulia, one they of the did. competitors that was out there. Yeah, they did. Yeah. So, yeah. So in many ways, they're trying to be the go-to place you start with, right? You start, I mean, a lot of people, and you know this, they don't even call a real estate broker up until they feel like they have the lay of the land for, well, what's the price in, in this part of San Jose? Yeah, what's I think, the price yeah. in this part of Redwood City, right? Yeah, because I've, I, you know, I've been in the middle of this industry for so long, I have a pretty good, a pretty darn good understanding. And I do think that, um, you know, I give, I give some of the listeners some examples. I remember when, I think it was, uh, must have been early 2000s, I'll, I'll say 2002, 2003, maybe even four or five. That was when the first push, I remember, just, just because they secured the name eLoan, and all they mm -hmm. were, all they were, were, they just went to a whole different marketing concept. Hey, do your loans electronically, which meant really no different than what people did, but there was this kind of concept or this idea that, oh, wow, this is magical we're going to be able to do but which is funny what people didn't know is all it was is really marketing you still got on the phone with people you still meet email things at, at that back then they didn't make it that easy but but that's kind of where it all started but so if we fast forward now and i did this myself i know jack knows this i share one of my mm -hmm. properties i went on and i tested it for a number of different reasons like i always do i test a lot of these back-end systems and I did a, you know, refinance. Now, granted, it was a simple conforming loan, you know, on a rental property. And so it was pretty straightforward. I do know how to navigate the business. So, but I completely, I could, I closed a loan without talking to one person on the phone, every, even to the point where, you know, I set up the sign off electronically. They come up and gave you, you know, choices do you want to sign at your office or your house if so what time anyway my point a little bit is that i think i do think that there will be a time when this will become more commonplace with real estate too it's just going to take longer i really feel that way i mean and you know alone is I, I say this all the time alone is not an emotional thing even though people get a little worked up in anxiety for borrowing money, but a home is a very emotional attachment. This is why people still use real estate agents. It's interesting when they connect with a real estate agent and they spend some time with them and the real estate agent in their mind helped them find a dream home. There's this interesting, unique emotional connection that 
I would argue that most humans don't get with many other transactions, Jack, like that. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, the pricing money is more mechanical than yeah. pricing a real estate. Right. And pricing money, of course, you could look a lot of different places and look at the Fed funds rate and look at LIBOR and look at a lot of standard uh, metrics that, of course, banks are using as their own metrics for how they price money. So I think you're right. And the other thing I wanted to say about this digitization process, we're bringing up a society of children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, future generations that don't want to deal with people. They want to deal with machines. It's yeah. weird. Right. No, it's, it's like in our, yeah. in our day, it used to be you hired a travel agent to get your tickets and <laughs> you talk to a travel agent about yeah. what's the best place to stay and uh, what's the best restaurant to eat at. Today, people would look at you like you're nuts. I'm just going to go online. I'm going to go to Yelp. I'm going to go look at reviews on Google. And so we're bringing up a generation after generation that's sort of following your lead of, I don't really even want to talk to anyone. I just want to read it. I just, I don't believe what people have to say. I believe, I don't even believe what people say on the TV or in the newspaper. I actually believe what I read online in the comments and that's it. And they don't want to deal it. And I think that's a discovery that's happened recently with like Airbnb. Mm -hmm. People used to go to Airbnb to get like the concierge owner to tell them, you know, what is it that, uh, I need to know about spending a week in Mexico. And now it's like, no, I just want to have the key code to get in. I don't really want to deal with the fact that you left me this great Mexican coffee. I just, I just want to, I don't even want to interact with you. I don't want to know about your family. I'm not interested <laughs> in knowing. Like to me, that was the whole part of doing Airbnb was getting to get the concierge service, but right. I'm old school. Right. I think that if we talk to my kids or my grandkids or in the future or great grandkids, they'll be like, I don't want any of that. I just want it to be seamless and smooth. And in fact, like the hotels are moving to that model. Mm -hmm. Where if they can pass a key code to you and tell you, sort of the way the rental car companies now, if you yeah. have the right. rental car access, you just go uh -huh. right to the car. Yeah. No interaction, no showing the license, no nothing. Just go right to the car, drive away. People want the seamless kind of mesh of it's just all uh, friction free. No human interaction. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe they'll accept a human pouring you a margarita or something as you land, but that's about, <laughs> that's about that's about as much that's about as much as they're willing to to accept all the rest. And that's why, in a, in a way, Joe, I do think as much as people are against it, I do think we're going to see a welcoming of robotics. Yeah. In terms of these robots, that oh, you want a pizza? You dictate your order, and a robot makes the pizza, and then. Uh, draw, you know, brings it to your to your table, and the whole restaurant experience is quite different than interacting with the, uh, you know, with the person. I don't know whether you've seen it, but I've seen more and more. They don't even give you a menu anymore. You, you use a use a, a a camera on your phone to sort of uh, take the yeah, barcode. Right. Yeah, no more menus. Yeah, that's no true. more menus. And of course, they're saying, well, that's because we don't want people touching menus. But I think it's more that they want you to put your order in yourself and get rid of the whole paper aspect of the transaction and get the server out of the business of collecting the money and let the money all be handled kind of uh, in a digital way mm -hmm. as well as you were. But you know what that means? The future will be some robot that rolls it up to your table, mm -hmm. not a, not a server. And so I don't know what happens to all those people that actually like being waiters or waitresses because there are people that feel like they do add value yeah. to, to the consumption of a meal. But we are seeing this sort of seamlessness expectation. And certainly Zillow thought they were on the money and what they were aiming to do didn't work out that way. And of course, uh, this just may be one hiccup along the road to, to this you know, seamlessness in real estate transactions that may occur over time. Yeah. Well, it's interesting times. I do think we're moving in that direction. I would agree with you. And what accelerated um, 
I would say would accelerate a lot of this, but also probably became more adaptable, if you will, if that's the right word, is COVID. COVID has, believe it or not, accelerated the thought process and a lot of these things. And it's got, keep, it's got, I know it's got companies thinking, I know it's got boardrooms thinking, I know it's got consumers thinking like, wow, look at what we did, look at the changes we made and now look at this and look at that. And I wonder if I could run my different, my business differently, my life differently. Um, yeah, I, I do think it, it is interesting how quickly a lot of this stuff is moving to and what we're going to adjust and adapt to. But real estate, I still believe it's coming. My, my belief, I, I really do. I, I do think I could see, and maybe it's not in our lifetime, but I could see a period where, you know, technology is so good with virtual reality as you step right into the house and you could have the scents, the smells, the yards, you could have, it could be so good of an experience that uh, I could see with, with some of the stuff being offered eventually that we'll see more and more streamlined transactions in real estate. It's just going to take some time still. Well, your wife is a real estate broker, right? Isn't yeah. She? Yeah. So does she worry at all? Because you're sort of a real estate family. You do the lending part. She does the buying and selling part. Right. Does she worry at all? Or is she like, nah, that'll be decades from now? Uh, not really. She worries a little bit. But I think what most of them are seeing now, and maybe this is the phase one of it, that Jack, is I think most of them, on every transaction, they're getting, you know, they're they're wanting consumers want to negotiate more than ever. And so that that is part of this when you think about it, right? I mean, because when you think about it, when you start shrinking margins and you start condensing, you know, price and, and what the offer is, I don't care whether it's mortgage or real estate, the companies do have to start looking at their models. And that's one of the reasons. You know, we're about ready to, to, to partner with a company called EXP, which is a uh, national publicly traded real estate company that has no offices. And you have, you have to ask yourself, how in the world do they compete with a Cobalt Banker or a Century 21 or a Red Carpet or whoever they are, Sotheby's, when they insist on expensive physical offices, of, of which, by the way, no one occupies. <laughs> right. Right. It seems that sooner or later, if this if this catches on, if EXP proves that the virtual model works, probably what happens is the offices get replaced mm -hmm. by some number of I'm I'm going to call them RVs, but just think of them as vans, where you know the customer is picked up at their home in a luxury van, and is shown you know the typical buyer wants to see like a dozen properties before they settle on one. Right. And to do that in a luxury van with like six uh, displays that can actually provide kind of a data center for what have we seen and what was nice and how do you compare it? Mm -hmm. Because it's sort of like trying to get a complex decision and a comparison of a lot of intangibles as a particular family decides, well, how important is a pool versus how important is a view? Right. How important is a school versus how important is it's easy to walk to work or it's easy to walk to downtown Palo Alto? You know, like certain places, there are always trade offs like downtown Palo Alto. You're not going to have a view, right. but you're going to be able to walk. You're going to walk easily to downtown Palo Alto. It's hard to have both. Right. So, you know, to get that sort of data center attention It'll probably be in lieu of an office. It'll probably be like a smart car. Maybe it'll even drive itself. Uh, and it'll say, here's the route. We're going to see 12 houses over the next two hours. And you're going to be able to sort of have all the data on a bunch of screens and accelerate the decision process. Because I think the thing that really pisses real estate people, particularly buyers agents, is the buyer who just takes too long. Like they have to invest nine months and 26 to 50 different properties mm -hmm. before they get an offer written. And then the offer that's written is too low, right? Mm -hmm. That's a big transaction cost for that buyer's agent. 
Whereas I think the seller listing agent, the person that's listing for the seller, they love it because, you know, basically they list and they do their staging and do other stuff. And then the property will sell and the commission will happen without kind of a long, typically in this market, without a long delay cycle. Mm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting uh, times. I think it's only going to, you know, everything's going to start to evolve. That's one thing we could all be sure of. It's things are evolving and things are changing. It's interesting to see how this develops out, but we'll keep, uh, we'll keep everyone posted as there's new developments, as we always try to do in the real estate uh, world. But before we go, let's just uh, Jack, if you want to remind the listeners um, of what, uh, what your, uh, your team and you practice still and where they could reach you. Sure. Well, we, we, we have offices now really in many ways um, throughout the United States because I'm now a member of not only the California as well as the New York and D.C. bars, but also a member of the Florida bar. So we have an office, of course, in downtown Palo Alto. We have an office in Tampa, Florida. We have affiliated offices in New York and Oregon and Washington and Hawaii, and I'm a member of the bar in all those places, as well as D.C. But the best way to reach us typically by email, the website, of course, is www.computerlaw.com. The email is jrusso, J-R-U-S-S-O, at computerlaw.com. That's computerlaw.com. And we do still pick up the phone, and the main phone line is still 650-327-9800. But I have to say, people are generally not using the phone anymore. I think you've probably <laughs> seen that. They go right to email or they go to text messaging, which seems to be the other thing that, that generates immediacy, this idea of immediately texting someone. Or these days, they look you up on WhatsApp because WhatsApp is like become the global yeah. the global phone book. <laughs> and, you know, that's a, that's a Facebook, I guess it's called Meta now. Meta. That's, a, that's a Meta. I mean, that's like part of the Meta business is having this global phone directory i have to tell you here in mexico everyone uses whatsapp because they don't rely on the phone company they rely on wi-fi and whatsapp as the phone carrier effectively (laughs) and they don't even keep track of phone numbers they just work off of whatsapp which is uh, the phone number but it's still still pretty much internet phone yeah it's interesting you say that i could tell you that uh I've lived it from experience. I don't know how many hundreds of, of leads now we've generated through Bundle Select. And do you know that, um, I don't know, maybe after all those hundreds of leads, there might have been maybe three or four people that ever requested a phone call. Can you imagine? It's always text or email. It's, it's yeah, I agree with you. It's just, especially a younger generation, they actually, uh, to a certain extent, I think I think some of them get anxiety and nervous when they have to get on the phone or talk in person. <laughs> well, you know what they think. You know, you know the unfortunate part of life is that people immediately think that if you have to get on the phone, then you're selling me. Okay. If you're trying to get me. If you're trying to get me on the phone, it must be because you're selling me. All right. Not that I've been sold by your offering. And now it's just a question of kind of the smooth, friction-free digital way of consummating the deal. But if I have to get on the phone, it means there's a certain complexity to this sale Mm -hmm. that you need to kind of walk me through and get me off the ledge of reacting to it, whether it has a back-end cost or a monthly cost or... Like, like there's some aversion to, I don't want to be sold. And I know if I get on the phone, there's some person that's going to try to sell me. It's almost like the new thinking is if what you have described in whatever you've described it, whether on your website, Facebook, Instagram, wherever you described it, LinkedIn, if I'm not sold by all that, I don't really want to get on the phone to be sold. Like yeah. that's the thinking. Now, of course, there are exceptions. And for example, I think in picking a broker uh, for real estate, I think you would interview a few people, probably even in person, uh, to really make sure the fit is right. Because obviously, uh, if you think the person is not going to get the best price for you, uh, you, or the best set of terms, 
Yeah. I'm going to go ahead and sign off because I think we're kind of losing the connection. So I want to thank Jack Russo for joining us again today. And we'll be back uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm sure, with another update on anything that's going on. But in the meantime, uh, if anybody wants to reach us, it's reradiolive.com. That's reradiolive.com. Or you could uh, email joe at reradiolive.com as well. Thanks again for tuning in. Until next time, have a great afternoon and take care. You've been listening to Real Estate Radio Live. For more information on today's program, visit reradiolive.com. That's reradiolive.com. Subscribe to our podcast. Discover more at reradiolive.com.